Welcome to the program. I'm Jeff Sheckman. Immigration and the fear of outsiders is a deep strain in the American psyche. It didn't start with Donald Trump. It hasn't even reached its full flowering under this administration. When Trump talked of murderers and rapists coming across the border or of other nations not sending us their best, he was merely echoing a historical context that has actually played out in far worse ways in our contemporary history. From the Chinese Exclusion Act to the highly restrictive immigration acts passed in the early 20th century, the white Christians have seemingly always felt under siege. To make matters even worse, in the early part of the 20th century, the rhetoric and false science of eugenics was weaponized in the immigration battle. This is the story that my guest Daniel Okrent tells in his new book, The Guarded Gate. Daniel Okrent was the first public editor of the New York Times. He was editor-at-large at Time, Inc. and managing editor of Life magazine. He's the author of the best-selling The Last Call. And it is my pleasure to welcome Daniel Okrent back to this program to talk about The Guarded Gate, bigotry, eugenics, and the law that kept two generations of Jews, Italians, and other European immigrants out of America. Daniel Okren, thanks so much for joining us. Well, thank you for having me. It's uh, my pleasure to be here. It's a delight to have you here. When we talk about this period at the end of the, the 19th century, the early 20th century, talk a little bit about the immigration that was going on at the time, the pushback to that immigration, because it wasn't eugenics that created the pushback. Eugenics was something that was weaponized in the battle. Talk about that framework that's a, first. That's exactly right. The 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 big um, immigration right after around the time of the Civil War and after was the Chinese immigration, and uh, that uh, led to uh, probably the most uh, specifically racist uh, piece of legislation in American history, the Re- Chinese Restriction Act of 1882, uh, that kept out all Chinese. Um, from that date forward, uh, the immigration from Europe began to pick up, particularly from Eastern and Southern Europe, from Italy first, and then from the lands that were uh, under Russian rule in the Russian Empire, uh, what is now uh, Poland, uh, Latvia, Lithuania, Ukraine, Russia itself. And these were poor people um, who had were em- emigrating from, the, from their countries uh, Partly out of desperation, the uh, uh, standard of living uh, in southern Italy particularly was was, uh, almost uh, medieval, Um, and from religious persecution among the Jews of the Russian Empire, who were under the uh, um, the thumb of Tsar Alexander II, who uh, imposed all sorts of restrictions on their you know, where they could live, what kind of jobs they could have, and so on. So uh, beginning, uh, it really begins to accelerate around 1890 and 1892. Ellis Island opens up, and the slums of the of the uh, large cities of the East Coast are filling up, and the anti-immigrationists, largely Protestant, largely at first of the from the upper classes, begin to get really agitated and start to try to get laws changed to keep these people out. What was the fear of these people? Where did that come from? Was it the poverty? Was it the economics? Was it the sense that they were different? Where did that fear start to emanate from? I think it was the latter of those uh, more than anything else. Of course, the others were also factors, but it seems to be uh, part of human nature that whatever group you're in, you have to find another group you can look down on. Uh, In fact, in American history, this has been kind of an alternating uh, um, kind of pattern, you know, as far back as 1750, 1753 exactly, Benjamin Franklin wrote about the Germans who were coming to Pennsylvania and how they were destroying the culture that had already begun to uh, to form in Pennsylvania. And then, you know, we go into in these cycles where it's first uh, um, we are the land of the free, bring us your 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 huddled masses yearning to breathe free, and then keep out, then come in, then keep out, and then come in, and keep out. And at the end of the 19th century, it became a very strong keep out. The, the, uh, apart from the um, discriminatory aspects of it, there were the economic aspects. Uh, the, panic, the panic of 1893, 1897, um, they had a serious effect on the employment uh, numbers in the U.S. And so even the labor unions, the nascent labor unions, they were also very strongly against immigration at that time. Was there also a sense of somehow the fragility of the culture that bringing in outsiders would somehow change things? 
Well, this is the beginning of the eugenic idea, which we'll get right. to in more detail later, I'm sure. Uh, but Teddy Roosevelt, um, you know, the, the great progressive leader, he he said uh, he spoke frequently of what he considered to be race suicide. And race suicide, they simply put, was the uh, the notion that the white Protestants were reproducing at a much slower rate than these immigrants were, and that in time the immigrants would take over the nation uh, and dominate the American bloodstream, which is actually a phrase that he and the other anti-immigrationists of the period used. And it wasn't just fear of, of the other and fear of criminality, as you know we heard from Donald Trump a couple of years ago. There was almost the sense that it would change the morality of the country. Uh, this is where the eugenic idea begins to really take root. Eugenics begins in the U.K. around uh, 1860, 1870, first as a kind of a, in a strange way, a, a, a positive idea. Let's try to breed the best of the best and, and improve our country. But then it becomes negative. Uh, let's keep those who are lesser, for whatever reason, uh, from reproducing. And the very prominent scientists from some of our major scientific institutions and universities, uh, they actually argued that not only were the with those things that we would all accept as being genetic, uh, 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 as being heritable, you know, height, hair color, so on and so forth, but these people were A, less intelligent, and B, more likely to be criminal, and C, they were morally deficient, and the eugenicists actually argued that morality was itself something that came down not through environment, but from the genes. There was a, a Darwinian element to all of this that really drove the train in so many respects. Yeah, it, it, it begins out of that great scientific ferment that uh, arises in the middle of the 19th century with the publication of Darwin's Origin of the Species. Uh, stop and think about it. Um, until 1859 and then the acceptance of evolution that followed, the the universal view, all but universal view of the origin of mankind was Adam and Eve. Now, if Adam and Eve, um, they're parents to all of us, then we are all related. We are all cousins and brothers with one another. But once you establish, as Darwin did, that we do not come from Adam and Eve, then, well, hmm, they're not as good as we are. We are not as good as they are. There's this sense of we're not related any longer, so we can make these discriminatory distinctions. How much of this pushback and, and how much of the, the anti-immigration sentiment really comes out of this dramatic change as a result of Darwin's idea and a really different way of looking at the world? Uh, absolutely, it does. Uh, the other thing that happens around the same time, although it's not discovered uh, until 1900, is, is the um, research of Gregor Mendel, the Moravian monk who really sort of discovered that genetics actually existed, that things were specifically inheritable. And the two ideas put together uh, led to the flowering of, if you can, or maybe whatever it is that weeds do, um, but let's say the flowering of eugenics as an idea. Talk about the way in which these two things then came together, the way in which eugenics became weaponized, really, in this anti-immigration battle. Well, if you go back to 1895, when Senator Henry Cabot Lodge introduces the first really tough anti-Eastern and Southern European immigration bill, uh, he and his uh, cohorts, they passed legislation through Congress four times over the next nearly 20 years, and four times it's vetoed by presidents. They aren't getting anywhere with it. Presidents being very mindful of the rising vote in the ethnic communities and in the U.S., uh, uh, they see reasons to, to, to veto it each time, um, once by Grover Cleveland, once by William Howard Taft, twice even by Woodrow Wilson. And then in 1916, they're saved. The, gen the anti-immigrationists are saved by the publication of a book uh, called The Passing of the Great Race by a very wealthy New Yorker named Madison Grant, who incidentally is also the man who's responsible for saving the redwoods of Northern California. He was known at the time as the greatest conservationist in the country. And he believed it was all of a piece. We need to preserve the landscape and we need to preserve the bloodstream. So he wrote this book um, that was based on no real science at all, but it was very imaginative and it was very lively in its writing, uh, that argued that we can tell, uh, that, that we can apply the eugenic idea not just to individuals, here's this person who may not be genetically sound, but to entire racial and ethnic groups.
paragraph in the book that's really, really chilling and kind of as emblematic of his thinking of those of his associates. Uh, he divides the European population into three groups. The, the best at the top are the Nordics. They're blonde, they're tall, they're blue-eyed, they're smart, they're brave. In the middle, not so hot, are the Alpines. At the bottom are the Mediterranean, so are short and swarthy, and they're not so morally great. And then he, write, he writes that, not, that science is established even though it had not, um, that the marriage of any two individuals, if they are of different groups, racial groups, that the offspring of that will revert to the lower of the two groups. So he writes that the marriage between a Nordic and an Alpine produces an Alpine. The marriage between an Alpine and a Mediterranean produces a Mediterranean. And the marriage between any of the three European groups and a Jew produces a Jew. And this, the chilling nature of this, it's not just chilling because of what uh, he thinks of the Jews, but the implication of this ladder of quality uh, in Europe is really horrifying. Talk about the ways in which this filters into the politics of the time, including and, and, and perhaps penultimately with Coolidge buying into this. Uh, it, it becomes something that the anti-immigrationists can pick up to show that they are not being discriminatory, they are following the rules of science. So instead of saying, you know, we don't like the Jews, we don't like the Italians, we don't like the Greeks, we can just say, well, we have this problem with eugenics. They may be fine people, but they're not the kind of people we want here. They're going to mess up the bloodstream. So by 1921, Calvin Coolidge, about to be inaugurated as vice president, he writes an article in, all, uh, in Good Housekeeping of All Places that says that now that biological laws, that's his phrase, biological laws have proven that these people are inferior, we must have legislation to keep them out. And then that ultimately results in, in the passage of this restrictive Johnson-Reed Act in 1924. Yeah, the, the uh, Immigration Restriction Act of 1924 is this landmark in American immigration history. Um, first, it reduced the number of immigrants that were, that were allowed in, and then it divided them. They gave quotas to each nation that they came from, and the quota was ostensibly based on the percentage of people from any given country who, who were already in the U.S. So if 10 percent of the American population uh, derived from Germany, then 10 percent of the new immigrants could come from Germany, and so on. Uh, but they didn't use the 1920 census to determine what the population of America was, nor the 1910, nor the 1900. They went back 24 years to 1890 before the large immigration from Eastern and Southern Europe had started. And so the quotas, they cut viciously. Um, there were as many as 220,000 Italians who came in a single year uh, just, just before the quota went to effect. And after the quota, the Italian immigration was limited to fewer than 4,000 a year. And scariest of all, this law was in place for 41 years. Uh, throughout the Depression, throughout World War II and its horrors, uh, throughout the World War II aftermath when displaced people were, were all over Europe but couldn't get out, couldn't get into the U.S., uh, this was really a horrible, horrible disruption I believe, of the natural growth of the American population. And just as frightening were the number of people that bought into this, people that were part of, of not the extreme eugenics culture, but really part of the mainstream political and artistic culture of the country. Right, and many of them were progressives, uh, even though there's a little bit of a distinction between the way we use progressive today and, and the way it uh, was used then. Uh, but take, you know, for, for an example, uh, Edward Ross, he was a very prominent sociologist at the University of Wisconsin. In fact, he was the uh, president for a while of the American Sociological Association. And later in his life, he actually became the national chairman of the American Civil Liberties Union. But he wrote, as he, he described the people he saw passing through Union Square in New York, this is around 1914, he's seeing, and this is a direct quote, here's suit, low-browed, big-faced persons of obviously low mentality, ox-like people who clearly belong in skins, in waddled huts at the close of the Ice Age. And that's kind of terrifying. 
Joseph Lee was the leading progressive uh, uh, philanthropist and hero in Boston, really. He kept the schools open at night so immigrants could get ed- education. He founded the Massachusetts Civic League. He supported black voting rights in the South. Um, he also opposed immigration to such a degree, immigration from these countries, that he single-handedly financed the lobbying group that uh, actually engineered the law into passage. He wrote at one point that all Europe might soon be drained of Jews to its benefit, no doubt, but not to ours. He also said that he feared the U.S., if we didn't do something, would become a Dago nation. And this was a great liberal hero. What impact did World War II have, and how did that fit into the complexity of these issues? Well, uh, the, World War uh, World War One. I'm, I'm sorry. Go ahead. World War One. I mean, I'm sorry. Oh, oh okay. Uh, well, World War One. Uh, was viewed by the immigration restrictionists, the anti-immigration people, uh, in the terms of several of them, as the white civil war. Uh, It was a war between the northern European countries, um, England and France on one side, and Germany and Austria primarily on the other side, the best of of each of these nations going forward into battle, and they're dying off and providing an opportunity for the, for the dark little man, to use one of Ma- Madison Grant's term. So there was another cause of panic. Uh, here's this uh, a war that was, was savage in its intensity uh, that killed off many of those of the same racial background of the anti-immigration movement's leaders in the U.S. Um, so it gave them another argument. It gave them another platform to go on. The other thing that happened at the end of World War I is that immigration, which had paused from 1914 to 1918, for obvious reasons, suddenly picked up again, and the the uh, boats arriving at Ellis Island and Angel Island in California uh, and elsewhere, um, they began to appear much more regularly. We've talked about some of the mainstream folks that, that bought into this. Talk about what happened when Hitler basically drew on the American eugenics movement for some of his ideas. Well, the... German eugenicists had been in collaborating, cooperating with American eugenicists going back to 1905. They were not doing racial genetics, uh, racial eugenics particularly, uh, but they were studying any number of issues uh, that have to do with uh, the inheritance of genes. And they knew each other well. Now, when Hitler arrives, he takes them into his fold. He had already been reading some of this literature and, in fact, cites the 1924 anti-immigration law uh, in a couple of speeches and in his own you know, famous book, Mein Kampf. Uh, he sees the eugenicists as his greatest allies as he begins his hateful programs. In 1933, he says to the eugenic physicians in the speech, I cannot do without you for a single day, not a single hour. If not for you, if you fail me, then all is lost. And he became entirely dependent on them. And these uh, uh, scholars, these uh, scientists who had uh, developed eugenic theory, they were more than happy to join Hitler's camp. One of them, a psychiatrist named Ernst Rudin, he said that only through Hitler's work has our 30-year-long dream of translating race hygiene into action finally become a reality. And how did some of those in America that had bought into this eugenics idea, how did they respond to the way Hitler had embraced this? Well, some of them went along with Hitler. The one, one man in particular, Harry H. Laughlin, who was the director of the Eugenics Research so- uh, Office in Cold Spring Harbor, New York, and a very prominent figure in the movement and also in the sterilization movement, uh, he actually accepted an honorary degree from the University of Heidelberg in 1936, about three or four months after the university had purged itself of all its Jewish faculty members. But there were also many who saw that when it became, to use the, the, the word you used before, weaponized by Hitler, uh, weaponized in such a horrendous way, many scholars and many institutions suddenly said, oh my God, look what we have done. So uh, institutions like the Rockefeller Foundation, the Carnegie Institute of Washington, the American Museum of Natural History, um, the, the uh, uh, Cold Spring Harbor Research Laboratories, they suddenly washed their hands of eugenics. And by the end of the 1930s, the eugenic idea as anything that has scientific validity uh, is gone. The irony, I suppose, is that it was Hitler's embrace of eugenics that sped up, at least, its ending. Absolutely. And uh, you don't want to say thank God for Hitler for anything, but uh, this was at least one uh, 
positive byproduct. Now, I don't want to suggest that it died entirely. I mean, even as late as 1939, this is really kind of a horrifying moment in the whole story. Um, there was a bill introduced in Congress by Senator Robert Wagner of New York uh, to exempt 20,000 German Jewish children from the quotas that they could add on an additional 20,000 people for you know, the, specifically children. And Laura Hodling, who was the first cousin of Franklin Roosevelt and married, in fact, to the commissioner of uh, immigration at the time, she said, 20,000 charming little children will grow up to be 20,000 ugly adults. Now, that's not what killed the bill, but the bill did not pass because there was still enough of this sense of a racial distinction, a eugenic distinction uh, prevalent in the land. One of the reasons that it seemed to go on for so long is that there were very few voices, or so it seems, that really pushed back and spoke out loudly against the idea of it. They, there were some voices, but they just did not carry the day. The, the leading scientific voice was the great anthropologist Franz Boas, uh, who uh, from beginning in 1917, when he reviews Madison Grant's book for the New Republic, uh, he devastates the so-called scientific arguments. He, he shreds them, uh, not just with assertion, but with evidence as well. But people aren't willing to listen, and in fact, he is dismissed by Grant and others because he was himself. Boas was Jewish, so therefore he's just defending his own people. To what extent does it still exist today? What did you find in terms of pockets of it that are still around today? Well, the pockets don't exist in the academic and scientific institutions where they once thrived. I mean, the places, in addition to the, the institutions I described before, there's also Princeton University, Harvard University, and very clearly Stanford University, whose president, first president, David Starr Jordan, was an avid uh, anti-immigrationist to use eugenicist arguments. Um, the, the, uh, the institutions ran from it, and um, pockets of uh, today, you can find it lurking in darker corners of the Internet. Uh, there are, I counted eight different editions of Madison Grant's The Passing of Great Race that you can buy online, and these are overwhelmingly racist websites, uh, extreme right, uh, alt right, uh, websites. The, in the, in the academic world, uh, all those institutions I described before all those universities, you know, you, the eugenicists are either laughed out or chased out, uh, of those, of those universities. So I, I don't see, uh, any evidence of there being, uh, uh, you know, a credible, uh, advocacy for eugenics today. Daniel Okrant, his book is The Guarded Gate. Bigotry, eugenics, and the law that kept two generations of Jews, Italians, and other European immigrants out of America. Daniel, I thank you so much for spending time with us. It's been my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.